Hi, I'm Tom Temples. I'm an instructor with PetraSkills, and today we're going to discuss the topics surrounding seismic interpretation. We're going to talk a little bit about the different rules that we use to interpret seismic data. What are some of the goals that the interpreters use to, to make their determinations? Basic elements of the seismic features. A little bit about wave theory and some of the terms that we have to deal with. Some of the rules of evidence that we look at are what are the physical laws that control what you observe in the seismic data? What is your evidence that you see in the seismic data? And what are your uncertainties? And we have to quantify a little bit what those uncertainties are so that we can do a, a better job of hopefully picking more accurate locations and drill fewer dry holes. The goal of the seismic interpreter is essentially we're searching for some image in the seismic data. We need it to be repeatable by more than one observer. In other words, if two people look at the same data set, they can see essentially the same thing. And therefore, it requires training. And there's a famous quote that says, you're trained, you see what you're trained to view. So we're going to hopefully give you some tools in your toolbox. This, The basic elements that control the quality of your interpretation in the seismic data in general are things that we call detectability and that's your ability to see things in the seismic image, and that's controlled to a large extent by what we discuss as signal-to-noise. Signal is what we're looking for in the seismic data. Noise is everything else, so we try and do our best during the acquisition and processing phase to minimize as much noise as possible and enhance the signal. The other thing we have to be concerned about as interpreters is resolution, and that focuses both in time and space. Since all of our data is collected in time, the vertical axis will be in time, the horizontal axis is in space, and our ability to see things in the seismic data are controlled by those two, two axes. The other thing we have to worry about is image fidelity, and that essentially is can we focus in on the image we're trying to see. The two main questions as an interpreter you're going to really ask yourself is what is it and where is it? Do that, we're going to try to start out and understand some of the fundamentals of seismic wave propagation, um, things like amplitude and phase. How do we determine vertical and horizontal resolution? Um, a term called tuning, which controls our ability to actually resolve what we see in the seismic data. And then some of the factors that affect seismic resolution. So let's talk about that. We generally deal with two types of waves in our industry, P waves and S waves. P waves are sometimes referred to as compressional waves. They're, in the P wave, the particle motion is traveling along the same path as the wave is. In other words, if the wave is moving in this direction, the particle motion is moving in that direction. It tends to be the fastest of the two type waves. It also has some unique properties in that the wave actually gives us physical properties of both the fluid and the rock itself. The second type of wave we see is the shear wave. And in this case, the particle motion is actually perpendicular to the wave train. If the wave is moving this way, the ground motion or particle motion is actually in this way or this way. Sine waves tend to be slower, roughly about half the velocity of the P wave, and they are blind to the fluid in the rock. So that gives us some really unique things that we can look at. So by looking at the P wave and the S wave over the same rock volume, if we see the P wave change in character, but the S wave stay the same, then that change is a direct result of change in fluid in the rock. So that translates to the difference between, we can see the difference between water and gas, or gas saturated oil and water. So that's a really unique property. Shear waves also don't propagate through liquid, which means if we're doing work offshore, we have to come up with some special ways of collecting the data. Some of the terms that you'll see used a lot are things like wavelength, amplitude, frequency. And what is the wavelength? Essentially, the wavelength is the amount of time, the, the length between the peak to peak on a trough. If you think about a normal sine wave, we're measuring that distance between peaks. You can see here on this diagram where the wavelength is, is, is labeled. The, also, the other thing that we're concerned with is amplitude, and amplitude essentially is the wave height of the wave in 
to an interpreter to the seismic industry, that essentially equates to power or reflectivity. If I have a really high amplitude event, that means a lot more of the energy is being reflected back to the subsurface for me to record. So the interpreter, what that tells me is that the density and velocity contrast between the overlying and underlying units is really great. So if I understand a little bit about the lithology and the properties of the rock I'm working in, I can make some conclusions about whether I'm going from shale to sand or shale to limestone or sand to limestone. So it gives me some basic understanding of the, of the depositional system that I'm dealing with there. There are several useful equations that we have to use in this industry, and you can see them here on the slide. One is, what is the frequency? The frequency is one divided by the period. The period is the amount of time it takes for a wave train to go through. The other one we use a lot is, is, is a term called lambda, or wavelength, and that's the velocities of the formation divided by the frequency content of the seismic data. Those become important because if I know the period and something about the velocities of the rock, I can calculate the thickest formation that I'm able to see on the seismic data, which gives me a handle on resolution. So if I'm, for instance, if I'm trying to map a sand that's about 50 feet thick, but my seismic resolution is only 100 feet, then that's uh, a pretty good indication that I really won't be able to see that reservoir that I'm trying to map, and I may have to use some different techniques to get there. I have some surface waves that kind of get in the way. Remember we talked about signal is what I'm looking for. Everything else is noise. We have some surface waves. One is called a love wave, which is essentially a surface shear wave. It's uh, generated as a general rule by the source I choose to create my seismic pulse into the ground. And then I have a Raleigh wave, which is a surface P wave, and that goes by the name ground roll. So we'd like to get rid of those out of the system. If I'm doing borehole geophysics, collecting velocity information or things like that, then I have to contend with what's called a stonely wave or a tube wave. And that's essentially the seismic image that rolls up the borehole at a boundary between the rock formation itself and the drilling mud in the, in the hole itself. That can create a noise train that makes it difficult for me to be able to extract the velocities that I'm trying to pull out of the seismic data. How do we get a reflection? Well, that's determined by the density and velocity contrast between two units. If you take the product of the velocity and density of the overlying unit and the velocity and density of the underlying unit, that'll give you a ratio which is called the reflection coefficient. Essentially, so if the reflection coefficient is positive, that means the overlying unit has a slower velocity than the underlying unit, and on the seismic data, I get a reflection to deflection to the right, and that's called the peak on the seismic data. If the reverse is true, if I have a higher acoustic impedance above and a lower acoustic impedance below, in that case I get a negative reflection coefficient or a trough. So when we see peaks and troughs on our seismic data, we can draw some conclusions about whether we're going from a low to a high or a high to a low. And again, if I understand a little bit about the geology and the lithology in the basin, I can start making some conclusions and drawing conclusions as to what my lithologies look like, what the layering looks like in the subsurface, which will also help me determine where my prospects are, what my traps are, where my seals are, and more importantly, which zone within my seismic section is a reservoir rock. We have two types of wavelets that we see in our seismic data. One is called a zero-phase wavelet, and the other one is called a minimum-phase wavelet. If I'm only mapping structure, then it really doesn't matter whether I'm dealing with a minimum-phase wavelet or a zero-phase wavelet. But if I'm trying to do anything else, such as look at AVO or attributes or do seismic stratigraphy on the data set, then I really need a zero-phase wavelet. Zero-phase wavelet, however, is not a real wavelet. It's a made-up wavelet. So we have to take our data and manipulate it and rotate it through a, a phase. And you can see here on this slide, the zero-phase wavelet is on the top and the minimum-phase wavelet is on the bottom. The difference between the two is the, the actual event itself on a zero-phase wavelet occurs at the maximum amplitude which helps me define really 
easily where the bed boundary is. As you can see on the zero phase, on the minimum phase wavelet rather, the energy starts at the interface and builds up later in time, which makes it somewhat problematic for me to figure out exactly what the, the phase of the data is, and it clouds my interpretation some. How do I determine phase? Well, there's several different ways. One is you can talk to your processor, and he can tell you what phase the data is. Sometimes you're working on a data set that's older or has not been recently processed and you still want to know the phase. We can make a pretty good attempt to at pulling that out of the data set. We can look at things like the seafloor for working offshore. The water bottom reflector will give us a very good event that we can then take a look at and see what the phase of the data looks like. If I have a hydrocarbon contact, a bright spot, for example, in the data set, I can use that as well. Um, I have other things I can use if I have salt in the section. The reflection between the overlying sediments and the salt can be used to determine whether or not what the phase of the data, the base of salt, if I can see it, and if I have um, hard rock basement, igneous and metamorphic rocks, I can sometimes use that as well, although those last are not as good, good of a tool. So those in kind of a nutshell are the beginnings and the basics that we have uh, to get you to be a good seismic interpreter. The next module will talk a little bit about something about the uh, interpretation techniques.